that I told you is brought to you by the India-based Neutron Observatory in association with the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, India-based Neutron Observatory is a mega science project uh, with a budget of more than two crores. Um, and the aim of this project is to initiate several uh, neutrino experiments to study the properties of neutrinos. And the aim of this lecture series uh, that was introduced by uh, Dr. Satyanarayana is to uh, tell you something about neutrinos, some basic concepts uh, in a sort of outreachish uh, style. It means that you know, it is not intended for you know, postgraduate students or students who already have an introduction to particle physics, it's especially for people who don't have absolutely no idea about neutrino physics. But nevertheless, if you have some idea, it's, but the design of these talks is aimed at uh, very basic ideas. And as Mr. Dr. Satyanarayana introduced me, I'm uh, from Central University of Karnataka. I already worked with Ayla for a uh, few years, and I still work with my students uh, in the applications of artificial intelligence uh, in track reconstruction and charge identification and so on and so forth. So the uh, <clears throat> aim of my talk today is to introduce you to certain uh, neutron experiments and to the phenomenon of uh, neutrino oscillations. One of the main experiments in the neutrino INO, uh, India-based neutrino observatory, is what we call as the iCAL experiment, the iron calorie neutral experiment. And the iron calorie neutral experiment will measure what we call as the oscillation parameters. And I will tell you in my lecture, uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, what these parameters are, what do we mean by oscillation parameters, and how does one measure these parameters in an experiment with reference to the ICAL experiment. And uh, before that, uh, uh, that uh, about, before talking about neutrino oscillations, I will uh, say a few words about uh, some neutrino experiments and the uh, problems or the crisis that the field of neutrino physics faced uh, in the graduate days and how these problems were solved, the solutions that were arrived, how these solved solutions were arrived. And that will set the stage for the rest of my talk. All right, so before I begin, I must put a disclaimer that what I'm going to say in this lecture is primarily aimed at non-technical law. And therefore, some details are uh, suppressed in you know, so that you know it doesn't look very uh, complicated for you. And it sometimes might appear incorrect, but it's correct in the spirit of my lecture. My lecture is just to introduce uh, uh, the, the basic concepts in neutrino physics and not. So neutrinos have been with us for millions and billions of years, but the first clue to their existence came from experiments that studied what we call as the beta decay. And uh, uh, the problem was that the experimental limits were contradicting the theoretical traditions. And it was in 1990, the solution to this problem, uh, uh, we proposed the particle neutrino as a solution to these problems. It was just a theoretical uh, uh, proposition at that point of time in 1930. It was in 1956 that uh, the famous Renaissance and Kumon uh, designed an experiment in which the neutrinos were first detected. And ever since, there have been a lot of activities worldwide, uh, including in India, uh, which we call as the KGF experiments, the polar gold field experiments. Uh, uh, so these experiments discussed neutrinos, and all these experiments gave us further insights about the properties of neutrons. At the same time, uh, these experiments also gave to certain problems. Overseas, people uh, not understand what these are, but eventually all these questions were, all these, uh, all these uh, problems were solved. One, and in 1988, the first prize was a As of 2018, there yeah, uh, have been four Nobel Prizes awarded to scientists working with 
And yet, it's not the end of the road, as you can see. A lot of open questions, a lot of challenges, a lot of unknown parameters in neutrino physics. And as you will see from uh, more lectures that weeks, uh, the, uh, the many more interesting things about uh, neutrinos. And I know is one experiment. I can is one experiment that will answer these these questions. And uh, what I will do in my lecture, uh, if you've seen the road I've shown you, I will halt at certain landmarks. I will explain certain experiments, the crisis they faced, the problems they faced and how they eventually overcame it. And finally, I will explain about the Ivan Alkal experiment in detail. So the first experiment that I want to highlight is the beta decay experiment. Beta decay problem, uh, which in the 1920s. <clears throat> in beta decay, what happens is a neutron converts itself into a proton and an electron. Now the masses are given beneath these uh, particles. Uh, with the, um, show. So these are the masses of these particles. This is 930 neutron mass is 930 c squared. The electron mass is 0.511 mv c squared. The proton mass is 938.272 mv over c squared. Now, uh, some people might not be uh, uh, know, might not know these units, but doesn't matter. Just what is important is just these numbers. So, a neutron converts Now, you can apply the law of conservation of energy and try to calculate what the energy of this electron will be. Now, the law of conservation of energy tells you uh, that... The, Deepak? Yes. Please. I'm sorry to disturb you. Uh, so, sometimes yeah. your audio is just a little bit breaking. So, if you can come a little closer to your uh, 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 computer, uh, mic, and uh, just if there is... Yeah. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Is it, is it okay now? Yeah, it's better, but sometimes it's a little bit fluctuating. All right, all right. Okay. okay. So, all right, so the, in the beta decay problem, this is what happens. So you can apply the law of conservation of energy and try to calculate what the energy of the electron will be, the electron emitted in the beta decay. Now, the law of conservation of energy tells you that the energy before reaction is equal to energy after reaction. So energy before is just the energy of the neutron, and after will be the energy of the sum of the energy of the proton and the electron. So here is a small calculation that I've done. You will find the energy of the electron that is emitted in this beta decay. Now you can make a plot of the electron energy spectrum. That's a plot. The electron energy is on the x-axis and the number of electrons on the y-axis. And because we calculated that the energy will be 0.782 MeV, what you see in such a graph, the plot, is that there'll be a peak at 0.782 MeV. And that means that all the electrons that are emitted in a beta decay will have the same energy, 0.782. They have moment uh, with an energy of 0.782. However, this is not what they found in an experiment, in the experiment. Experiment, what they found was the electrons uh, were not more energetic. First, from number two, that they had a spectrum. They were, the electrons that were emitted have different energy. Some electrons came with, uh, uh, for example, 0.5 MeV, some with 0.4, some with 0.3, and so on and so forth. So, uh, this was a confusion. Uh, why is it a confusion? So, the spectrum that is seen from the experiment is shown by this curve approximately. Now, why is that a confusion? Now, if the electron is coming with an energy less than what is expected, uh, that, is, that tells that probably the law of energy conservation does not hold anymore. That means the law of conservation of energy is violated. Uh, and it was uh, a crisis because uh, people could not accept that the law 
podcast for energy is being violated. And it was Pali who proposed a solution to this problem at that point of time. And the solution is very simple. Uh, you can look at this uh, uh, graph here. What you see is, this is the expected peak, 0.782 MeV, and this is the electron spectrum. Electrons are emitted at energies less than 0.782 MeV, predictable value, but you don't see any electrons emitted above 0.782 MeV. You don't see an electron with 1 MeV or 10 MeV or so on and so forth. So there's something happening there. So the question is, if the electrons are emitted with energy less than 0.782 predicted value, there should be some other particle that is taking away this energy. For example, if the uh, electron is taking 0.5 MeV, uh, there should be some other particle which is taking like 0.3 MeV. And uh, that particle is what we call today as the neutrino. And those uh, actually decay uh, is not a two-body decay, it's a three-body decay with the third particle being the neutrino. Now, by a simple analysis, one can figure out the properties of neutrino. For example, in nuclear reactions, in fact, reaction, charge should be considered just like energy. This, the charge before should be equal to the charge after. So the, the charge before the reaction is the charge of the neutron. The neutron is neutrally charged, it carries no charge. And after the reaction, the neutron becomes proton and an electron and the neutrino. And proton is positive charge and the electron is negative charge. The sum of this charge is zero. And for the neutrino should also be neutral electrically. So now we have concluded that the neutrino has to be neutral particle, which should be chargeless. We can also guess the mass of the particle by this uh, simple estimate from this energy spectrum of electrons. I don't want to get into that, but we can uh, uh, refer to some books. So what we can conclude is that from energy spectrum, in fact, from the endpoint energy of the uh, energy spectrum, one can conclude that the neutrinos are almost massless, number two. So the neutrinos are chargeless, the neutrinos are massless. Furthermore, uh, the question remains, now, why don't we see this neutrinos if they are really emitted in a beta decay? Like, we can measure, detect and measure the electrons. Why are we not able to measure these uh, neutrinos? The reason is probably that these neutrinos are weakly interacting. So weakly interacting, they don't interact with the detector material and therefore they don't leave any signal. And it is true today that we know that neutrinos are chargeless, massless, and they are that they are so weakly interacting that they can even penetrate through the earth and come out. Now, uh, so, so now the problem is very clear. Now we know that the neutrinos are there. The problem is how do we detect these neutrinos? They're chargeless, massless, and uh, they are uh, weakly interacting. So that's a very difficult part, notoriously difficult part to be detected. So, but however, it's weakly interacting. It, that, it doesn't mean to say that it doesn't interact. It means that it weakly interacts. You know, once in a while, it does interact with neutrinos. So in 1956, these gentlemen, Linus and Cohen, they designed an experiment to detect neutrinos. Linus and Cohen worked for the uh, Manhattan Project at Los Alamos Laboratory, as you all be, uh, be aware, that at that point of time, the Manhattan Testing nuclear weapons, atomic bombs, and so on and so forth. Scientists knew at that point of time that an atomic explosion is a good source of neutrinos. So, Hennis and Cohen submitted a proposal to detect neutrinos uh, that are emitted in an explosion. However, the proposal got rejected on the basis telling that. I know that every time you want to do, repeat the experiment, you need to have an atom bomb explosion, which was not uh, technically and economically feasible. So they were asked to find another source of neutrinos. And some people suggested, uh, well, if uh, atom bomb is a source of neutrinos, so should the reactors. 
A nuclear reactor is a controlled fission uh, process. So a nuclear reactor should also be a source of nucleus. And therefore, Rhinus proceeded to uh, set up the experiment close to a reactor site in South Carolina, Carolina and United States. So, um, so the detector setup is shown here. Now, how do we detect neutrinos? Now, we can detect neutrinos directly by secondary particles that produce. One of the modes by which neutrinos interact is what we call as the inverse beta decay. And that reaction is uh, shown here. Now, why is it called inverse beta decay? You bring the positron to the other side, the left hand side of the reaction, it's the inverse of the beta decay expression. Because in a beta decay, the neutron goes into a proton, uh, electron, and a neutrino. So it's just the reverse of that reaction, just that the electron on the other side becomes a positron. So in such a reaction, of course, this, this reaction does not take place every time. It takes place occasionally because of the reason that I told you, the neutrinos are weak to neutron. A neutrino interacting with a, a proton would give you a neutron and positron. So if you find a mechanism of identifying these two particles in the final state, then it's a signature of a neutrino interaction. So what you need for this reaction to take place is a sort of it's the reactor. And we also need a target containing a lot of protons. Now, uh, 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 water is a good source of this. Water is H2O, hydrogen is uh, just proton. So if you have water, then you have the target material for the neutrinos to interact. So here is the detector setup. So A and B are water tanks with water, and this one, two, and three are uh, detectors, which are scintillation detectors. The details are not required now, but probably will come to know the next few lectures. So the A and B are target material for the neutrinos. So neutrinos interacted in A can interact in A or B uh, with the protons, and they produce neutrons in positive. But how do we identify the neutrons and positrons? The positrons would end up with the electrons in the material and produce the honeylate and produce two photons. And these photons give scintillation light in these days one and two. For example, if the neutrino had interacted in A, the positron that is produced in A would annihilate with the electron and produce two photons. And by virtue of the kinematics, these photons would go back uh, in opposite direction. For example, if one photon comes in one, the other photon comes in two, the second scintillator. So this is the signature of a positron being produced in the neutrino. And uh, if you have a, a scintillation seen in this detector and in the scintillation, at the same time you see a scintillation in number two, uh, that's probably a positron annihilation which is produced by the but that's the signal definitely, but that's not a sure signal because there are other processes by which the same signal can be produced and they need not be from a neutrino. So in order to eliminate such background, you, uh, what Rhinus and Powan did was to devise a mechanism to detect the neutrons which are emitted in this, not only the protons, but also the neutrons. So how did they do that? Neutrons, uh, they interact uh, they, they undergo a reaction called a neutron capture, in which a nucleus absorbs a neutron, and the neutron, uh, the, the nucleus gets excited, and when they de-excite, they emit photons. And those photons can also be detected, just like the photons emitted by the uh, positrons. Now, cadmium chloride has a very good neutron capture process, very good probability, very high probability to capture neutrons. So that cadmium chloride was mixed in the water uh, tanks A and B. So when a neutrino interacts with the proton, you get a signal from the positron by virtue of these two photons which are emitted back to back. And also a photon is emitted by the neutron. Now, if you see two photons, one in tank one and two, and after that you see another signal uh, photon that is a clear signal of uh, the 
of a neutron interaction. One thing that I must remind you is that the photons that are emitted by the neutrons come after a certain time delay. That is because the positrons interact immediately, almost immediately, but the neutrons wander through the material and then get captured. And there's a time delay between these two. So the time delay is about 10 microseconds. So if you find a signal coming now, and after that you find a signal coming after uh, 10 microseconds, that's a clear signal of a neutron interaction. And this technique is what has delayed coincidence. They coincide after a delay. And uh, Linus and Cohen did find such signatures in the detector. And uh, to, to be even more conclusive, what they did was they switched off the reactor and then they saw that the counts decreased. And once again, when they started, they saw that the counts increased, which is, it was a clear signature of a neutrino interaction. Now, following the success of Rhinus and Kowan, uh, many other experiments were devised. Uh, one of the famous experiments is the Ray Davis experiment. Uh, uh, so, <coughs> the, in the Rhinus Kowan experiment, what we saw was uh, that uh, the reactor was is also a source of neutrinos. In the in a reactor, the, the, the neutrinos are emitted due to fission, whereas in the sun, the neutrinos are emitted due to the fusion process. Uh, there's something called as a PP chain in which a lot of neutrinos are emitted. So uh, the neutrinos uh, emitted by the sun are taken to a tank, which is kept 1.5 kilometers underneath the gold mine. And this tank is filled with some chemical, mainly chlorine. This is a chlorine tank, you can call it. It's like 14 meters long and six meters, it's a cylinder, six meters diameter. So it's a very rich tank. And these neutrinos, which interact with chlorine, they produce argon and an electron. So by counting the argon in the, uh, the tank, one can conclude or one can count the number of neutrinos that are emitted by the sun. However, what they found was that the count from the experiment was much less than what was predicted by theoretical estimates. The theoretical estimates come from what we call as the solar model. And uh, uh, the experiment saw that the counts from the tank was much less than about one third of what is estimated in theoretical uh, calculations. At that point of time, this crisis was called as the solar neutrino problem. Now, people started to wonder where this problem uh, could be. Some people blamed the experiment, some people blamed the theory, and uh, nobody knew what was the exact source. Now, this was not the end of the story. At the same time, there was a similar set of experiments uh, done in Japan called as the Kamiokande experiments. They did was they designed an experiment to measure the neutrinos. First case, what you saw was the reactor was a source of neutrinos. The second experiment, you saw the sun being a source of neutrinos. Uh, the atmosphere is also a good source. The Kamiokande experiment designed, an ex uh, designed uh, a new detector to study these neutrinos. And what they uh, found was that the number of neutrinos in the atmosphere was much less than what was actually expected. Now, the Ray Davis experiment and the Kamiokande experiment are done in two different places. So Ray Davis was done in the United States, the Kamiokande is, is done in Japan. The source of so, so neutrinos for the, the Ray Davis experiment is the sun, whereas for the Kamiokande, it's the neutrinos, the atmospheric neutrinos. And they use two different technologies. That's a radiochemical procedure, whereas this is a Cherenko detector. So all everything is different. Everything is different. And therefore, uh, people are wondering what could be the cause of the deficit seen by the Ray Davis experiment and the Kamiokande experiment. At that point of time, people thought 
that probably these neutrinos are uh, probably disappearing in between. And that disappearance or changing into something else, which we don't see, uh, which is now called as neutrino oscillations. And what I'm going to do is to demonstrate the idea of uh, neutrino oscillations using a simple uh, animation. All right, so what I have here in on my left is a uh, uh, one is the red torch. The red torch emits a uh, red light. And there's a, also a blue torch, and the blue torch emits blue light. On the, on the right, I have, I have a red camera and the blue camera. So the camera, the red camera can click on pictures of red light. The blue camera can click pictures of blue light. So by counting the snaps from these cameras, one can count the number of particles emitted by these. So if you want to count the particles from a red torch, one would use a red camera. And if you if one, would, one, one wants to count the particles, blue torch, you would use a blue camera. Now, what I do is I swap the cameras. For example, I place a blue camera in front of the uh, red torch, and I place a, a red camera in front of the blue torch. Because these, taught, these cameras are not sensitive to these particles, what you will see is that they will not see any counts. So they will measure zero counts. This camera will uh, zero counts because it's not sensitive to red particles. And similarly, this red camera will see zero counts because it is not sensitive to blue particles. Now, back to square one, I've done, uh, what I've done here is I have a red torch here and I have a blue camera on the right hand side. Now, what I want to do using this experiment is to calculate a quantity called as the surviving fraction. The surviving fraction, I define it as the number of red particles detected by the camera by the red particles from the torch, all right? So this experiment is going to work as we know because it's a red torch and I've set my experiment carefully because I know I'm going to get red particles from this torch and therefore I put a red camera. If I had kept a blue torch, I would have kept a blue camera. So let's see what happens. Particles coming from the torch, they travel across and then you see in between, they're changing their color to blue. Because of this changing in color, what happens is that this, though the color of the nature of particles emitted by this torch, because of these particles changing their color, the number of the surviving fraction as measured by the camera will be zero. And this is the exact thing that, uh, this is a similar thing that happens in neutrinos also. So in neutrinos, not the color that changes, it is what we call as a flavor that changes. Neutrinos change the flavor as they travel through space time. The three flavors of neutrinos, electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and so as an electron neutrino travels through space time, can convert into a muon neutrino, or it can also convert to a tau neutrino. It happens to muon neutrino also. If you shoot a muon neutrino through space time, it gets converted into electron neutrino or a tau neutrino, and so on and so forth. Now, before we get into this, so this is what we call as neutrino oscillations. The change of flavor as a function of distance is what we call as neutrino oscillations. Now, before we get into the details, I want to introduce certain terminologies and terms that are uh, used in. Now, what happens when a neutrino interacts? Now, there are two main modes by which a neutrino interacts. So, 
So as you see, if a neutrino uh, interacts with matter, it can produce the corresponding left points. For example, uh, let me repeat, the electron neutrino gets in, interacts with matter and produces an electron. Similarly, the muon neutrino interacts, interacting with matter, it produces a muon and a tau neutrino interacting with matter. All these three are charged particles. And if you see a charged particle, you call that interaction as a charge. So if you see a charged lepton in the final state, you call it as a charge interaction. Now, in a charge current interaction, you see that by measuring the flavor of these particles, I can guess what the flavor of the neutrino is. For example, if I see an electron coming out of a neutrino charge current interaction, I know the flavor of the neutrino that in induced that reaction must be electron. And if I see a muon in the final state of a neutrino interaction, charge current interaction, I know the flavor of neutrinos, uh, must, neutrino that induce that reaction must be a muon type. And similarly, uh, so in a charge current interaction, one can guess, in fact, one can immediately say the flavor of the neutrinos, neutro, neutrinos that cause the interaction. There's another type of interaction in neutrinos, which is called as uh, neutral current, in which the neutrino interacts with matter and goes out as neutrinos, was producing some heavy particles, which are not usually observed. So because neutrinos are chargeless, and you see the same neutrinos coming out, and neutrinos are usually not seen in the experiment. We call this interaction as a neutral current interaction. So these are, of course, of course, there are other interactions. You don't have to worry about it. But two main modes are charge interaction, in which the flavor of the neutrinos can be identified, and a neutral current interaction, in which the flavor is usually not seen. Now let's go back to the Ray Davis experiment and see uh, uh, in light of what we discussed, what the sun is the source of electron neutrinos. Right? And the experiment, as, you, as I told you, the experiment detects electron neutrinos by these electron neutrinos interact with chlorine to give you argon and electrons. Right? And by counting the argon, we came to the, uh, we, we got the, idea of electrons. And before we saw that the number of electron neutrinos as counted by this procedure was much less than uh, what was theoretically predicted. And now we know the answer. The answer is as the electron neutrinos travel through space, they get converted into other uh, types. Whereas your camera or detector is not sensitive to the type in which to which the electron and this is what has led to the deficit uh, as measured. Now, is there a way that we can uh, find, or is there a way to uh, prove that it is because of oscillation? Yes, what you can do is to put a detector that is sensitive to the flavor, oscillated flavor. For example, it's like putting both the red camera and the blue camera side by side next to each other, or a camera which can detect both red and blue particles. And a similar effort was taken by for the snow experiment. The snow detector in Canada can detect all the three flavors of neutrinos by the neutral current interaction. The neutral current is sensitive to all the three flavors. And of course, it can also detect neutral electrons Large current. What they found from the uh, experiment was that from the neutral, because it is sensitive to all the three flavors, it is like a camera which can, camera which can see all the three uh, uh, play, uh, all the three colors. What they found was that now, after including the neutral current uh, interactions, that the count rate or the flux was similar to what was expected from the solar model. Uh, and thus the problem was solved. 
Now let's come to the Kamiokande experiment. As I told you initially that the Kamiokande experiments measured a deficit in the atmosphere. What exactly was, was that uh, deficit? Now, how are these cosmic neutrinos produced? They're produced by the decay of pions in the atmosphere. So this is the pion, for example, the pion as it uh, moves, uh, it decays into a muon neutrino and that muon neutrino is shown by dash nine and that muon neutrino because it's weakly interacting reaches the third. And this pion decays into a muon and a muon neutrino. So the muon still travels further and this muon decays into an electron and a muon neutrino and an electron neutrino. So in principle, a single pion leads to two muon decays. That is, this is one muon, uh, muon neutrino and this is another muon neutrino and one electron neutrino. That means in, a, in, in the, the atmospheric neutrinos, the ratio of muon and electron neutrinos should be, the, uh, should be two is to one because of this decay pattern. So the Kamiokande experiment uh, measured this ratio of the electron neutrinos uh, and uh, muon neutrinos and found that it is not two is to one, but that is one is to one. So this was what we call as an atmospheric neutrino problem. So how was this problem solved? So the Kamiokande experiment was upgraded to what we call as the super Kamiokande experiment. The super Kamiokande experiment is was a much improvised detector, a much bigger detector than the previous uh, experiments. So what they did was they measured the ratio of the muon neutrinos to electron neutrinos as a function of distance. So for example, so this is the earth. So the detector is shown in, this is the super Kamiokande detector inside the earth. So this is the atmosphere that I've drawn and the height of the atmosphere is around 12 kilometers. And this is the diameter of the earth. Now what they found is that the neutrinos coming from the top, the ratio of the electron neutrinos to muon neutrinos is the same. Whereas the neutrinos that are coming from the bottom earth, because they're traveling for a very long distance, the probability of oscillation is also higher and therefore the deficit is also higher. This is a conclusion, conclusive evidence of neutrino oscillations. So um, now it is very clear, experiments have concluded that neutrinos oscillate, they, they undergo flavor oscillations, but is it possible to, for us to tell us where the neutrino will oscillate? I shoot uh, a neutrino from India, where exactly will it oscillate? Now there's a theory that explains this oscillation uh, process. And uh, the, the, the theory tells that the oscillation probability, which I have shown here, P mu alpha mu beta, that probability that neutrino, which started as uh, flavor alpha, gets converted into beta flavor, where alpha can be E, mu, or tau. Uh, it's not the alpha particle or the beta particle. So please do. But this is a suffix. Alpha can be uh, on mu or tau, beta can be electron mu or tau. So this probability, we call it as a oscillation probability, is equal to sine squared two theta, sine squared 1.27 delta m squared L by E. It's not a very difficult uh, uh, derivation, but it requires some background in quantum mechanics, but I leave it for now. But this is something that uh, you should take home. The probability oscillation probability is equal to sine squared two theta sine squared 1.27 delta m squared L by E. Now this theta is called as the mixing angle. And delta m squared is called the mass squared difference. Now the mixing angle, if the mixing angle had been zero, the mixing angle is zero, then the ex entire expression will be zero. So that means that if theta is zero, there will be no oscillation at all. Similarly, if delta m squared is zero, then the oscillation probability is zero. Therefore, for a neutrino to oscillate, two things that, that must be satisfied. Number one, the mixing angle should be non-zero and the mass squared difference should also be 
not so. Now, what is this mass square difference? You don't have to worry about it right now. It's the mass of the uh, mass eigenstates, but uh, let's call it the mass of the neutrinos for time being. So this, uh, in order for the neutrinos to uh, uh, oscillate, the neutrinos must be massive, right? So now, uh, how does this probability look like as a function of the known parameters, L and E? The L and E are known parameters. Theta and delta M squared are unknown parameters. So any oscillation experiment, any neutrino oscillation experiment, the goal would be to measure theta and delta M squared. Now, how do we measure this theta and delta M squared? Now let's write it in a different form. Let's write this equation in a different form. So in a familiar form, if I write this, this becomes y equals a sine two pi x pi lambda. And this immediately says the amplitude of oscillation is equal to sine squared two theta. So by measuring the oscillation pattern, the amplitude of oscillation pattern, one would get the uh, value of theta. Also, uh, you see that two pi x by lambda would be equal to delta m squared L by E. So therefore the lambda is related to delta m squared. By measuring the wavelength, one would measure the delta m squared. So here is a graph. On the x axis is L by E delta m squared and on the y axis is the probability of oscillation. So from this graph, one can estimate the uh, amplitude from which you get this uh, 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 mixing angle. And you can also measure the uh, wavelength from which you would get the mass square difference. However, it's not straightforward. Now, when you make a measurement, you fix L and you fix E, and therefore you get a single point. You don't get a complete wave. So in order to get the complete wave, you need to do the experiment at different uh, lengths different distance, so I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. L is the distance between the source of neutrinos and the detector. E is the energy of the detector. So in order to measure the probability, this, this probability oscillation curve, of, uh, pro, uh, oscillation uh, probability curve, one would have to make a measurement of probability at different values of L and E. That means you might have to uh, put the detector at different distances and measure the probability, or you have to change the energy of the neutrinos, uh, or you have to change both L and E. However, it's a very simple mechanism by which you can do it, uh, by which you don't have to change the N or E, which I'll explain in the next slide. Now, the I know I can experiment is, uh, uh, is a, Massive uh, experiment, massive detector. It's around 50 kiloton. It has a one Tesla magnet. So you see this magnetic coils here. And these are uh, iron plates. And inside these iron plates, you have uh, called as resistive plate chambers. So you have a total of 30,000 resistive plate chambers. And this is essentially a muon detector. And that means that you will not be able to see an electron uh, neutrino interaction or a tau neutrino inter interaction in this detector. You can see it is more sensitive to muon detector. Now, why do we have this magnetic field and all those things will become evident in some time? But this is, uh, you can, as you can see from the dimensions, the 48 meters by 16 meters by 14.4 meters. It's quite massive, 50 kilotons, and be one of the heaviest electromagnet in the world. All right, now let's go back and see what, what, what we're going to do with this experiment. So as I told you, there's an uh, oscillation experiment. As I told you the goal of any oscillation experiment is to measure the mixing angle and the mass square difference, theta and delta m square. Now, how do we do that? First of all, this oscillation probability can be um, rewritten in this form. The oscillation probability is the number of muon neutrinos detected divided by the number of muon neutrinos that started from the source. Now, this number of muon neutrinos detected 
comes from your detector. So you count essentially the mu number of muon neutrinos of the jet detector. And the number of muon neutrinos that have started from the source can be estimated from the neutrinos that are coming from here because they, they don't get oscillated. So it, it's, it comes unoscillated. So the number of neutrinos coming from the top can be used as the denominator in this equation. So just by counting the number of muon neutrinos in your detector, you get P. Now the next question is, how do we measure L? How do we know uh, the distance that the neutrino has traveled? That's straightforward. Now let's say a neutrino has, you see, you see that the neutrino has come from the bottom, then you know the diameter of the Earth is 12,000 kilometers, and you know the distance that the neutrino has traveled. Now, of course, there's an uncertainty in the production, but that uncertainty has to, uncertainty has to be taken into account. And similarly, if the uh, neutrino is coming from this distance, by simple mathematics, simple geometry, we can estimate the distance that the neutrino has traveled. So from knowing the angle in which the neutrinos have come from, you can predict the distance that the neutrino has traveled. So we know now how to measure P. We now know how to measure L. The only thing that remains is how to measure E. Now, when a neutrino interacts, as I told you earlier, so primarily because this detector is sensitive to muons, these muon neutrinos will produce um, muons in the final stage. So um, as the muons in fact uh, are produced, they pass through this detector and produce hits in the pattern as shown here. So this is a simulation. Of course, we don't have a real detector. So you see that this is the track of the muon. And this muon track is a slightly bent, as you can see, there's a curvature, right? So from this curvature, you can estimate the energy of the neutrinos. The muons are produced by the um, neutrinos themselves. So therefore, from energy conservation, the energy of the muon should be approximately equal to the energy of the neutrino. And the energy of the muon is estimated from this curvature. So there are very, uh, 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 of course, it's a very simple thing to be said, but there's a complicated algorithm that works behind to estimate the, uh, the momentum, the energy of the muon from this curvature, right? So now we have estimated all these three quantities, P, L, and E. So, you're, so if once you have all these parameters, you have all, 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 and from which you get uh, your mixing angle and delta m squared. Of course, this is a very simplified, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, explanation. There are many things that not, it's not delta m squared, that there's something called delta m squared, uh, uh, um, two, three, one, three, and so on and so forth, but I don't want you to worry about it uh, right now. So. Now the question, next question I want to answer is why do we have this magnetic field? Now, this magnetic field is required to distinguish between neutral interactions and anti-neutral interactions that now uh, when a neutral interacts, it produces a muon, and an anti-neutral interacts, it, in it produces uh, a mu plus. And uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, these two particles will move in opposite directions and from which we can tell whether the interaction was from a neutrino or an anti-neutrino. And this is one of the unique capabilities of this ino icon. The next problem is, now you see that in the previous uh, slides I showed you, yeah, it's here. So uh, in the cosmic rays, Muon neutrinos are produced here, somewhere here, then, after the muon V case. So this muon neutrinos, in turn, produce, by way of interaction, produce muons. At the same time, there could be some muons which are unoscillated and come to the detector. So it's very difficult to distinguish the muons that come unoscillated 
and the new ones that are produced by this uh, neutrinos. What we want to find is only the neutrinos, which new ones which are produced by muon neutrinos, and not the other new ones at all. So, in order to prevent the other ones which are the cosmic ray from confusing us, we need to shield our detector from this extra new ones. So, you know, so therefore, most of the neutrino experiments, including the IMO ICAL, have to be kept inside uh, a mountain or have to be. This is a mountain. Uh, we, as of now, we, we have chosen a place near uh, Madurai, um, close to Peni. So this detector, the entire Rhino ICAL, this massive magnetized detector, will be placed inside the mountain. And what will reach inside the mountain is just neutrinos and not the, uh, the muons as such. And this is one important aspect. So as of now, we have quite a, a lot of activity uh, happening in Madurai. A lot of students go there for summer internship. Uh, we work and simulations and uh, data acquisition systems. So if any one of you are interested, you can write to uh, the INO or to uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Deepak. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, really nice, uh, complete, uh, you know, the entire spectrum of uh, things as far as the neutrinos and neutrino detection is concerned, but still managed to keep it at a very uh, popular level so that uh, most of them could kind of understand and comprehend. Uh, so I do see uh, there are uh, questions from uh, some of the participants. Uh, since we have not taken any questions during the uh, during our lecture, uh, so I am going to kind of unmute them all. But uh, what I suggest is please only uh, please mute. Of you, please mute your uh, mics and only the person who wants to ask question, now mute. Hello, sir. Yeah, please tell your name. Yes, yeah, sir. My name is Pinak Mandal and I'm doing MSc from Tejpur University. Okay. Uh, uh, sir, my question is Deepak, that... can you hear? Deepak, can you hear the question? Just once, hold on. Deepak? Deepak? Uh, just a second, just a second. Actually, uh, unfortunately, I don't see Deepak online. Just give me a, give me a second. I think there must be some difficulty. In, uh... Sorry, I got disconnected. Ah, ah, okay, okay. So I was just uh, calling. Yeah, so please go ahead. Uh, ah, hello. hello, sir. My name is Pina Kundal. Okay, so I think my uh, screen has been, uh, you have to enable my screen sharing. Oh, is that? Uh... It tells me that I cannot share. My... Ah, okay, okay. Uh... How come I don't see you on the... Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, I did. Okay, so... Uh, yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah, please go ahead with the question. Sir, how can we uh, uh, determine the energy of the uh, neutrino from the bending of the moon track? Oh. Bending of C, it requires 
So it's from the Lorentz force, uh, Lorentz equation. You know, this uh, F equals V plus. Uh, all right, the velocity comes into picture. Picture. Okay. All right, and the magnetic field also comes into picture. Hello. So, hello. Hello, sir. But, yeah, but sir, uh, the neutrino does not contain any charge. So, uh, classically, uh, is it uh, measurable? Is it uh, possible to determine the energy from? Uh, no, no, we are, we are, we are not measuring. It's not a neutrino which is bending. It's a muon that is produced by the charge current interaction, which is bending. Muon is charged, no? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. So it is the muon. From muon's energy, we deduce the neutrino's energy. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello, sir. Myself, Nikhilesh Mavi. Yeah. Is it not possible to have uh, neutrinos being uh, encaptured in a circular orbit like uh, just how we you how we can isolate electrons in uh, uh, cyclotron uh, no for the, just because of the reason uh, that they are chargeless to make a particle bend you need to apply a magnetic field and anyway uh, these neutrinos are chargeless so you cannot make them happen so electrons are charged particles so therefore it's easier to bend but uh, can we still use uh, Einstein's theory so that we can bend the space around it, or can we do can we do something uh, about it? Uh, as of now, I don't think anybody has even thought. The first thing that we need to have uh, the neutrinos are weakly interacting. That itself is very difficult, you know, and they travel at the velocity of light. I don't know of any theory. Yeah, uh, I, I must uh, also say, Professor Vivek Datar, who is the project director of the INO project, is also online. Uh, uh, in case you would like to answer this. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we all can. Okay. Hear. Yes, yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, I mean, the uh, I think uh, uh, some, uh, Deepak has answered the question. Uh, it would be uh, impossible to create a uh, such a intense gravitational field if you want to bend the neutrinos in a detector of finite size you would require a black hole to do that and if a black hole exists then uh, of course we won't uh, be around we'll be sucked by the black hole ourselves okay, okay. So that's not a, a viable approach uh, uh, please all of you except the person who is asking question please mute your mics so can i uh, uh, is there any other questions? Is there any other question, please? Yeah, there's one. Yeah, Nishan Power, do you have a question? Huh? I mean, Pradipta, I think you have to mute your phone. What? Hello, are there any other questions to this piece today? Excuse me, sir. I have one question. Yeah, please, please tell your name and then go ahead. I am Shalish. Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, in the solar neutrino problem, uh, the expected neutrinos were less yeah. than what solar model predicted. Yeah. Was there some La, yeah, accepting yeah, the yeah, solar yeah, and yeah, looking yeah, for yeah, things yeah. 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 Hello? Yeah. Uh, I have muted. I think Pradeep, the, somebody was uh, talking. Yeah. Uh, is the question clear to you? Uh, no, no, it's not very clear. Uh, can you please repeat your question, please? Yeah, sure. So, according to the solar neutrino, uh, solar model, the neutrinos which were expected from the sun, uh, there was a deficit in the neutrinos detected in the experiment. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, uh, the explanation we are looking here is that something must have happened to neutrinos. Uh -huh. What was the motivation behind not discarding the solar model itself? 
were there some some other observations which indicated that solar new uh, solar model is probably right um uh, then there were some uh, indications where well, i don't for, I, i've forgotten the reasons exactly but in fact there was it was not immediately accepted there were people, people who even criticized the theory at that point of time but there were some certain ind indications that it was not possibly wrong i don't remember the reasons if you do now i i don't know if professor dathar can yeah uh professor dathar are you there Professor Dathar, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, I am okay. here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. So there was a question that what was how, favor in favor of solar model? Why, why didn't we discard the solar? Model? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can, but can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 The, uh, one of the uh, you know uh, key reasons why the solar uh, model was became acceptable was. the uh, some of the work that uh, uh, a group at tfr professor chitre and uh, his uh, at that time his phd student did uh, uh, to show that uh, you know the the uh, uh, seismic waves of the sun uh, the you know the surface temperatures and so on they all agree with the uh, uh, the observations that you had about the sun Uh, this was one of the actually a key uh, uh, you know uh, uh, theoretical predictions and which was borne out by observations uh, this was one the other was also that the nuclear cross sections that are relevant to uh, the production of uh, nuclei that beta decay uh, mm -hmm. they were also measured to accuracy is necessary to be able to say that the prediction of uh, the solar neutrino flux indeed across the energy spectrum was correct to within 15 to 20% and the disagreement between the uh, observation and uh, the uh, theoretical calculation was by about a factor of 3 in the case of uh, the davis experiment so it was well beyond the error bar uh, that one had and that is how this uh, came to be known as the solar neutrino problem and uh, a call uh, was one of the key architects as i said also there were other people uh, that uh, provided evidence uh, to say that and of course another key element uh, that was thrown in later was that uh, the the uh, oscillation parameters had to be tuned a lot in order to get the numbers right uh, the uh, research of wolfenstein mikhaev and smirnov showed that there were matter effects so what uh, deepak uh, uh, described was the vacuum oscillation so called vacuum oscillation however when neutrinos pass through matter uh, the some of these parameters can get changed and indeed they can uh, there can be resonances which can uh, affect uh, some of the uh, neutrinos very deeply and uh, it was shown that the mikhail smirnov effect is a very robust way of getting the right numbers that we actually observe uh, and uh, uh, another key observation uh, yeah actually uh, we have quite a few questions yeah sure. I, uh, uh, i would like uh, so uh, i see still uh, many hands rise uh, can you ask uh, the question somewhat precisely and quickly so that mm -hmm. uh, we able to cover as many as possible yeah next mm -hmm. please go ahead hello Yeah, anyone, anyone, please. Ah, so ready? No. Class is over. Hmm. Okay. Anyone who want to ask a question, please go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Sri Sahai. Hello. hello yeah please go ahead right now sir i had two questions first of all i didn't understand what is the mixing angle which you mentioned in the neutron oscillation pr probability could you explain that uh yeah yeah uh yes. 
Yes. Yes, sir. So, uh, what exactly is your question? Yeah, so asking what, what is, is mixing angle? Data? What is mixing angle? All right. See. Okay. So you have to start. Uh, to uh, I mean, this this oscillation, neutron oscillation, is a quantum mechanical formula. Uh, sorry, quantum mechanical formula. And uh, uh, the way you arrive at this equation is by writing the neutrino flavor eigenstate as a superposition of mass eigenstates. Okay, so that is to say, when we begin the discussion, we say that mu e uh, is equal to some c1 times mu1 plus c2 times uh, mu2 and c3 times so on and so forth. And you do it for all the three flavors. And then you see that you can, and then you impose all this normalization conditions and all this stuff. You can represent this uh, constants, the c1, c2, uh, c3, and all those things, you know, in terms of because. I don't have this uh, derivation right now. So these constants can be represented in various formats. So one of the formats by, is by using uh, theta. So for example, you know, uh, probably quantum mechanics, you know, usually it says that the sum of probabilities should be equal to one. So one of the parameterization is to use sine theta and cos theta because sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals to one. So theta right. enters in that manner, all right? But as such, uh, when you uh, uh, when you analyze a uh, oscillation uh, problem, so theta just appears as a parameter. So what we say is now, if there has to be oscillation, theta has to be, theta cannot be zero. If theta is zero, then the probability oscillation probability is also zero. Right. But sir, what is the exact physical interpretation of this uh, theta? What why is it See, called? It the tells you how much these three. Uh, mass eigenstate. I have not talked about the mass eigenstates and the flavor eigenstate. It tells you the amount by which these mix with each other, in, in some sense. Okay. Yeah. And sir, uh, you had men mentioned earlier in the presentation and that uh, uh, the neutrino is chargeless and massless while you were discussing the beta decay. Now, mm -hmm. chargeless, we can uh, directly assume from that because the charge is conserved in the mm -hmm. beta decay. How did we conclude the masslessness of a neutrino? Oh, okay. So that I didn't put much effort. Let me go back. All right. See, um, I think you're mentioning about this slide, right? Yes. So, uh, see, this the mass of the neutrino can be uh, uh, estimated from this endpoint energy. So, this is the endpoint energy. The point. The right. maximum energy of the electrons that are emitted in this. Right. Now, if you include the neutrinos also, what you have in this expression would be, you know, uh, kinetic energy of this uh, uh, neutron plus the rest energy, so on and so forth. Now, with the neutrino included, there will be an extra term here. That's right. All right. Now, right. That, uh, using that extra term, now you can uh, find out. No, so now if the electron takes a certain energy, the neutrino should take on yeah. the rest of the energy. Right. right. So now by seeing what is the maximum energy that an electron takes, when right. the electron energy is maximum, the neutrino energy should be minimum because the right. sum of these two should be 0 0.2. Right. So by seeing the maximum energy of the electrons that are coming out, you can estimate the energy that the neutrinos uh, taking so you see that is almost close to zero from which you will, you can say that they are massless. Maximum energy of the electron is zero point seven eight two approximately to, close to, close to that. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, we still have a few questions. Uh, next is Nishant Power. Nishant Power. Nishant Power, do you want to ask a question? Hello? Okay. Uh, we have a question from Shailaja. Hello? Uh, is it is my voice audible? Who is this? Uh, I am Shailaja. Ah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, you are uh, audible. 
Yeah, sir, I would like to, sir, uh, Deepak, sir, I would like to ask you, uh, you first, your first slide was about beta decay problem. And mm -hmm. you did talk about the energy that the law of conservation of energy that was only violated. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, is there any un other fundamental property of physics that is being violated? Because uh, we know that from the sun, we are, uh, that the sun is uh, creating solar neutrinos and all. So basic uh, reaction is two protons are decaying to form the neutron and uh, neutrinos along with an antineutrino. So I would like to know if, um, if any other fundamental property is being violated. No, no, no. See, that was an, uh, that, that time people proposed is they thought that it might be violated. It was not violated in the beta decay problem either. It okay. was just one proposal. All right? It was okay, people could not accept it. Accept that. It was. It's not true that energy is violated. People okay. thought as a solution probably that energy could be violated, but it is not really violated. So, but the energy generation in the star in the sun that starts with uh, two protons decaying to deuteron and a positron. You mean the PP cycle? Yes, yes, sir. Oh. So without like without the neutrino, or if there would be no neutrino, there would be darkness. If we would see, then it, it would be only darkness. So then I am asking about the angular momentum that would not be conserved. If the angular momentum would not be conserved in that reaction, then the then the whole world would be dark and we, what would we would see it would be only darkness mm. so even in this reaction if in fact without the presence of the neutrino even angular momentum would not be uh, uh, conserved in this beta decay also so, uh, that is so i can give you another example when the carbon uh, the carbon atom is decaying to give uh, on, uh, nitrogen along with uh, electron and an anti electron neutrino uh -huh. So in that case, if we see, then the daughter nucleus did not rec recoil backward in a straight line. Uh, uh, so uh, don't you think that the principle of momentum conservation is also violated? I'm sorry, I'm not able to understand this question. Uh, I'm also, uh, let me simplify it, uh, like um, the momentum of conservation of energy is violated. So is the moment of principle of conservation of mom uh, momentum is violated? I don't think so. I don't think that these are violated in any uh, Okay, sir. So my second question is, uh, if the ma like, uh, what is the basic difference between the mass eigenstate and the flavor eigenstates? Uh, see, they are stationary states. Mass eigenstates are stationary states. Okay. And uh, I still see Deepak quite a few questions. So there are also some All questions right. from the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, okay. I think we should take at least one or two from there, and we'll come back uh, okay. here. Uh, one of the question from YouTube uh, from Sadasiv Sahu. It says. What was the role of KGF experiment on neutrino studies at that time period? Oh, I think Professor Dathar can answer that question better. Okay. Uh, Professor Dathar, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the KGF experiment was actually to measure atmospheric neutrinos for the first time. This was a, uh, you know, uh, there was also competition from the uh, Nobel laureate uh, Rhinus, who actually measured antineutrinos from a reactor, which uh, Deepak had mentioned. And so there was actually a race, and uh, our uh, team at KGF, of course, it included also uh, the collaboration of uh, Durham and Osaka scientists as well, and TIFR, uh, so Indian scientists. So they, uh, you know, published a paper uh, uh, with the discovery result about two weeks uh, ahead of the Rhinus group. Uh, but you know, two weeks in a span of uh, many, many years, it's okay, almost the same time. But in any case, our group discovered these atmospheric neutrinos for the first time in the KGF. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to take another one, uh, Richie Sharma. Unfortunately, muons are the most unstoppable at even large hadron collider equipped with heavy metals. Then how much rock mountain oscillating and source muons would be separable? Deepak, you want to answer? I'm sorry, I didn't get the questions. Uh, 
it says that unfortunately muons are the most unstoppable at a large hadron collider equipped with heavy metals but uh, we are at a depth of 1.5 km yeah then the question is then how much a rock mountain uh, comma oscillating and source muons would be separable it's a little bit unclear but i guess uh, one is talking about what is the raw, you know rock depth you require in order to probably filter out all the neutrinos at as uh, sorry the cosmic muons uh, okay so that is uh, okay so she is talking about how do we separate the neutrinos that are penetrated so yeah. the, the, usually the vertex is a good information about the source of the neutrinos if they are coming the, the, the neutrino would interact somewhere inside the uh, uh, Detector volume, but a new new one that is coming would start right away from the beginning. That mm -hmm. would be a way of way to separate them. Yeah. Uh, so let us come back uh, to uh, the Zoom session. Uh, we still have one minute. Let me ask uh, Akshay. Do you are you there, Akshay? Akshay, hello. Is there one by name Akshay? Ah uh, yes. Ah huh? uh, yeah, but uh, not us. Hello, Akshay. It's starting, I think. Okay. Um. I guess now I don't see any any more raised hands. Uh, so on behalf of uh, the I know project once again, on behalf of all of us uh, who are there online right now, and also those of uh, participants from the YouTube, as you know, YouTube is live uh, with this lecture. Uh, so let us thank uh, Deepak for his very nice lecture and also taking up. Uh, all the questions at the end of the lecture and uh, let us also thank uh, professor vivek tatar the project director who also actually participated in the question answers thank you very much for both of you thank you thank you very much yeah bye and i think we have to inform them about the next lecture ah yes uh, so those of you who are still online uh, please remember that uh, we have the next lecture uh, planned day after tomorrow at the same time uh day after tomorrow is wednesday at the same time and um, just give me a second uh so this lecture is going to be of course from 6 to 7 on 29th april this will be by saikat biswas uh from bos institute and he is going to talk on detectors for high energy physics okay so once again you are all welcome to join at uh, 6 o'clock on 29th april on the same this the 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 zoom link is exactly the same right so thank, thank you everybody you. good night and uh, take care and stay safe thank you bye 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 okay